for asthma and things like that, I know exactly what you're going through. I used to, California, before I ever got around to taking shots or anything, every May, I used to i go riding at the ranch, and I'd end up with three or four handkerchiefs tied to the saddle <laughs> before I got back. Well, we'll move along real quickly here, because I know you've got uh, time problems, and it's nice to see you again, as always. Uh, Democratic leaders, particularly Walter Mondale and the other Democratic contenders, have really been slamming you repeatedly and uh, will likely step up those attacks for the huge $200 billion deficit that the government's racking up. And uh, they're saying your administration, over its four years, will have increased the national debt by $700 billion, which is uh, from uh, your budget reports, or nearly three quarters of a trillion dollars. What's your answer to Mondale and the others? Do you accept any blame for that? No, not a bit. And I think that uh, it's time to point out that uh, they keep calling it the president's budget. It isn't the president's budget. Under the Constitution, there's only one branch of government that is authorized to spend money. That is the Congress of the United States. And if the Congress of the United States had given the President of the United States in these last few years the cuts in spending that the President asked for, the budget would be $40 billion less, or the deficit would be $40 billion less than it is right now. I think it's time <coughs> people like yourself who have a great opportunity to talk to the people Instruct the people of this country a little bit as to just how all of this comes about and who is responsible. The, first of all, uh, we don't think the deficit is going to be $200 billion. I can't give you the figure we're looking at right now. But the recovery uh, has been so much better than had been anticipated that we think that we're, we're going to nibble away at that. And the most practical way to reduce the debt is to get economic recovery. To get those people that are out there now uh, as being helped by the government financially because of their unemployment. To get them back working, earning, and paying taxes again is what will make the biggest drop up. More than half of the present budget deficit is structural. The other half is cyclical, that is caused by this recession. So you can deal with one half of that deficit through the economic recovery. You deal with the rest in getting the spending of government down, and that means Congress having the courage to do what they haven't done yet, and that is to deal with the entitlement programs. And they haven't made one change in those, and they are the principal cause of the other half of that deficit. Nevertheless, Ronald Reagan and the Democrats in Congress uh, have sent uh, budgets to Capitol Hill for fiscal 83, fiscal 84, which call for deficits of $91 billion and $189 billion respectively. If the President submitted spending requests, which actually propose such huge deficits, the budgets propose those deficits, how can you dare ask Congress to do any better? Because it's apparent and was apparent from the very beginning after almost 50 years of this kind of economics, that you could not, in one jump, pull the rug out from under people who are totally dependent on many government programs. You had to bring this down in a way that would preserve a safety net for the people in need. And as I say, not pull the rug out from under them. And so what we aimed at was to get us on a declining pattern of deficits to where down here we could foresee the day of the balanced budget. And uh, I might also point out that the sincerity of uh, those who want or don't want deficits, I think, is exposed also uh, in the fact that I have been asking for, and pleading for, a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced budget. And it has been mainly the majority party in the House that has uh, refused to even consider this. Mm -hmm. And I doubt if any of those candidates for president want such a thing. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the, all right, I shall. Nevertheless, uh, if you don't propose those cuts, how do you put the full weight of the, uh, the, the chief executive behind the Congress to steal them to make those cuts? 
example, here's an article that I did some time ago that uh, uh, suggested where we could cut uh, deficit by at least $100 billion, maybe $175 billion. A lot of proposals that many people might not agree with, but many people would agree with some of them, or a lot of them. Uh, if the budget doesn't propose those cuts, I, mean, I got a note back from Ed Meese on this saying, fine, can you just tell us how can we bring this about? And I wrote back to him and said, Ed, you have to first propose them. Well, now, wait a minute. No. What do you, you say about that? Uh, what I have to say about that is you also have to face the reality of whether you can get it or not. Now, even with the reductions that we asked for, we couldn't get all of them. As a matter of fact, um, the budget that I sent up for 1984 in January, Congress wouldn't even consider it. Now, I have to be aware of that. I don't sit here all alone with this. We meet with congressional leadership of both parties. We talk with the committee chairman and the leadership on the budgets that we're proposing. And we have to face up to our, what are the realities. And we still ask for more than they're willing to, to give us in cuts. But uh, it doesn't do any good to just send a budget up there uh, that would not even be considered. And we did in 84, as I say, and even though it was not as drastic as, as uh, what you were earlier suggesting, as I say, the, they, they simply refused to even consider it. Isn't that so tacit to uh, giving in to their appetites? And there are uh, excesses? No, I think there is a recognition of reality since the Constitution says they are the only ones who can authorize and appropriate money to spend. Now, uh, there's nothing I could do about this except one thing that I'm doing now. I have sent word up there on the appropriation bills that now must come down that if they follow the pattern that they have suggested they're going to follow. The budget, for example, that the Democrat majority passed in the House and said that they had done it simply to reaffirm what was traditional democratic policy. And it called for billions and billions of dollars in additional spending and new programs. And I have sent word up that, that I will veto uh, any of those kind of bills that they send down. I wonder if you could look back over the past three years, perhaps in a self-critical way, and uh, the deficits, the difficulty, by your own admission in our last interview, of taming the bureaucracy, uh, of getting more control over uh, still rising federal expenditures. Look back critically and say, is there anything you would do differently? I mean, no one could bat a thousand. There must have been something that uh, you would have done, you would have been tougher on at the outset. Have you reflected on that at all? Well, one of the main things that I wouldn't do over again is fall for the line that I did last year and support an additional tax in increase after a tax cut, support the tax increase on the promise that there would be three dollars in cuts in spending for every dollar of increased revenue. And we got the tax uh, increase, but we never got the three dollars for one in tax or in expenditure cuts. Uh, I wouldn't be that foolish or that optimistic again I would be a little more cynical about such a promise. But I honestly believed it was a bipartisan approach presented me in that way and that uh, I supported it. On taxes, uh, I get the impression when you say that uh, sticking to your position of no taxes increase until 1986, that you have no problem in 1985 agreeing with tax increases for 1986 and beyond. If it meant certain terms. I said that we, if it would reassure the money market out there to bring interest rates down and to make them believe that this, uh, aware that this, that we were serious about getting rid of the deficits and balancing the budget, that if we were on a solid enough recovery, that we could be sure that a tax, a tax increase then would not uh, set back the recovery or set us back in the path we were on. If the deficit was above a certain percentage figure of gross national product, um, if I had in the interim obtained the spending cuts, which I had asked for, then that tax increase would be implemented to hasten getting rid of the deficits. But as I said, the program that we introduced once was aimed at, at 
at uh, reducing those down the line of ways where it could be done without total disruption of, of many programs, essentially, of people. But are you willing to pledge that you will not propose any tax increases that will in any way weaken or reduce the three-year tax cuts in the tax rates that you have already enacted? I will not give up indexing. I will not give up the, the straight income tax uh, cuts in rates that, uh, that we put into effect. Uh, no, because I think those are what are responsible for the recovery. Incidentally, let me point something else out that has contributed to the deficit and that we did not foresee. We didn't foresee that we were going to be as successful as we were in reducing inflation. And you know inflation is a form of taxation. The government makes money off inflation. And we did not believe that we could bring inflation from double digits this quickly down to where right now for the last 12 months, 2.6%. So our own estimates of revenues were off. Uh, my earlier question though was to weaken or reduce. In other words, tax cuts elsewhere could then bite into or weaken those uh, three-year tax cuts in the rates. Uh, are you willing to pledge that you're not going to propose tax increases elsewhere or in some other form that would weaken the tax cuts that you've given across the board? No, I think there are some things that, that should be looked at in simplification of tax, taxation, but also we should be taking a, making a study. Many people I know have talked about this. We should be making a study as to whether we don't have too much emphasis on taxing earnings and not enough evidence on taxing consumption. For one thing, if that should prove to be practical, that would be one way of getting at the secret economy, the tax-free economy that's going on in this country now with people that are operating outside uh, the taxes they couldn't operate outside of, of a tax on consumption. And how would that work? Who would that affect? Huh? How, how would that work? Who would that affect? Well, it would be taxes that would, would in effect, well, it would affect all the same, everybody and the same people. But it would be different uh, in that it would be taxed on uh, where you spent and uh, how you spent it. For example, uh, not that we want to compete with the uh, local and state sales taxes, but uh, there are ways to get at a consumption tax. The value added has been proposed as one. But don't cite me as approving anything. We haven't made this study as yet. It is something to be looked at because if you, if you make such a tax on consumption uh, such that it exempts the absolute necessities, um, such as in California's sales tax, it is not on, on food, it is not on necessities of that kind. Uh, then you are making a provision that is protective of the people of lower earnings and the people of the lower earnings scale. Uh, in another area, you've made some new proposals, so you know, the reduction of long-range nuclear uh, weapon reduction, so the build-down proposal. Uh, and if a break occurs uh, in the negotiations, there's the, this talk or speculation about uh, a summit next year. Uh, I think everyone realizes summits are useless unless there's a lot of preparation that goes into them. And perhaps they're not even, uh, uh, should not be held even because of the KAL K -A -L incident. Nevertheless, uh, here's my question. If Soviet President and Andrei uh, uh, Yuri Andropov were, in response to your proposals Tuesday, to propose a meeting with you in the White House, only with interpreters, and negotiate man-to-man, -man, face to face a general agreement of basic principles that would have to be contained in a fair and verifiable nuclear arms reduction agreement. In other words, an agreement to agree. Would you accept such a... If I thought that such a meeting could be held that would really result in a reduction of these strategic nuclear weapons, and in fact, if he wanted to discuss with me the total elimination of them, he'd find me very willing. But if I would have to know that we weren't just having a meeting to get acquainted and uh, to give them a, a, a propaganda opportunity, but a meeting that was aimed at <coughs> restoring civilization to the world, uh, I'd, 
be more than willing. I really mean that about restoring civilization. I told some of the members of Congress the other day, when I was a young man in the post-World War I era, and bombers were becoming a standard part of military, I remember a great discussion that raged among young fellows like myself about whether any young American could ever be ordered to drop bombs on civilians. We used to have a world when I was growing up in which uh, the rules of warfare were designed to protect civilians. They were not to be the victims of war. And here today, the greatest weapon systems that the world has are now war weapon systems that are designed to wipe out civilians by the millions. And uh, I have to say, I don't think we're as civilized as we were when I was a young man. Uh, would you propose such a meeting yourself if your negotiators told you uh, we're at an impasse, we think this is something that has to be broken only by the leaders of the two superpowers? Well, you're asking a hypothetical question here. Uh, as I say again, if they, if they were convinced and could convince me that there would be there could be progress in doing that. Uh, of course, I would. I'd cooperate. On uh, 1984, uh, there's going to be a new Reagan-Bush 84 committee that's going to uh, go into formation on the 17th of October. Mm -hmm. Under the rules, the FEC rules, you have 15 days to either not say anything, let it go forward, or disavow it. Uh, can you tell me? Have you personally? I don't think it's really understood. Have you personally given your sanction and approval to the formation of this committee? They told me they were going to form the committee, and I made no comment, one or the other. Mm -hmm. You didn't give your benediction upon it? Or? No. Uh, no. Uh, but I recognized the rules. Uh, you told uh, Jack Kilpatrick that you would announce your candidacy before the first of the year. Could you uh, give this uh, strong well, I young... I said I thought that, that uh, in just discussing what could be possible the last moment that I thought it probably would have to be done before the first of the year. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could give this struggling young col columnist a little uh, closer. Uh, will it be before Thanksgiving? <laughs> It'll be before the first of the year. Mm -hmm. Have you talked about running with Mrs. Reagan, uh, and, uh, particularly uh, regarding the attempts in your life? Uh, does she have any second thoughts, any, any fears about this kind of decision you're going to make? Well, I don't think any more that she has. Uh, at present, she, uh, uh, there's no question that that has been in her mind ever since it happened. I think it, uh, in many ways, was harder on her than it was on me. And I think that's usually the, the case in a situation of that kind. It's, it's much more difficult to be fearing for someone else than it is to fear for yourself. Um, We've talked, and are having talks. We, we never do anything solo. You talked about this? What? Have you talked about this? About the threat, you mean? No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, about uh, uh, running? Running for election. Uh, we've, we've had some talks and weighed things and back and forth. You know, contrary to what uh, some people, less journalistic eth ethics than you have, have suggested was that... Uh, she was an ambitious woman who pushed me into this. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, I think going in the opposite direction. I think, like most wives, that she was uh, reluctant but willing to do it if that was the decision that I had made. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, uh, that still pertains. And I, I'm grateful to her for that and for the support that she's been. But any family of anyone that for this position, Re has to recognize that they're giving up a great many things, uh, and literally forever, in uh, making that move, in privacy and so forth. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't put off a decision on running uh, until uh, very late, say the first of the year, and thus, uh, if you were to decide not to run, make it very difficult for Republican contenders to give them the lead time they need to mount a campaign, would you? Well, let me say that uh, such a good nature. That will be that will be a consideration of mine in when to announce that my decision. <coughs> How's your health? 
just fine, except for this bout I'm having right now with some hay fever. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're going to be 73 years old uh, next year, and if you're re-elected to a second term and serve it entirely, you'll be 77. Uh, the oldest president in history. I mean, considering the rigors of the office, uh, the mental pressures, the fatigue, do you have any doubts about serving in such a high-pressure office, uh, such a pivotal office in the world um, no. at that age? I haven't found it uh, that it is uh, deleterious to my health uh, so far. As a matter of fact, uh, I've gained an inch and three quarters around my chest in the exercises I'm doing. Uh, I've never felt better. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that's... That's a consideration at all, mm -hmm. making a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ran for a second term, would it be your intention to fill out the entire four-year term? And considering the alternative, yes. <laughs> <laughs> See what I give you a straight line? <laughs> There's a scenario circulating that, uh, perhaps a foolish one, that uh, you would serve maybe two or three years and then leave uh, office and but you may not have heard that or have. Uh, certain leaders of the political right, not a majority by any means, but key political activists on the new right and elsewhere, on evangelical groups, Christian groups, say you betrayed them, and that you have been strong on rhetoric with the Soviets, but weak and appeasing on key issues, such as on the Soviet downing of the airline or the relaxation of trade sanctions and technology transfer. Uh, your administration, the White House, opposed Senator Nancy Kassenbaum's very modest proposal to reduce the UN budget is a sign of our displeasure. Um, that you've overlooked the Reagan faithful in selecting moderates and liberals to uh, top appointments at HHS, DOT, EPA. Uh, Human Events said this week that you're sounding and looking more like Gerald Ford than Ronald Reagan. They have come to know and support. How do you respond to this fire from the right? Well, I haven't bumped my head once. Pardon me? I said I haven't bumped my head once. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, I know that those voices, frankly, I think they're louder than they are numerous. Uh, some of those particular ones that you mentioned, I haven't found any trouble with the uh, evangelical uh, movement. In fact, they've been most supportive of much of what we're doing. First of all, it isn't true with regard to appointments. Uh, uh, I think that we work very hard to make sure that those appointees that we name are completely in sympathy with the goals of this administration and what we're trying to do. Now, with regard to the tragic downing of that airliner, I know that I've heard the chorus that was raised, but there's been far more support for what we have done and how we did react to it. I thought of all the things that they suggested. You looked immediately as, what could you do? And yes, there were some grandstanding things that you could do that might I look good and say, aren't I tough, look what I'm doing. But they wouldn't really hurt the Soviet Union in any way. They wouldn't in any way retaliate for the enormity of that crime. Uh, then there were some things like, uh, uh, well, trade and, uh, and uh, favorable interest rates on trade and uh, that we were still going forward. No, we've been working for more than a year, two years, with our allies to get a correction of this sort of thing. And last year at the economic summit, we secured that. that there is no subsidized interest rates for trade with the Soviet Union. The, we worked for a long time and of and uh, an agreement with our allies with regard to high tech, and that was also mentioned, and the restrictions on that to the Soviet Union. That's, that was agreed to last spring. Now. If you could get the rest of the world, because this isn't the Soviet versus the United States, this is the Soviet versus the world in this crime they've committed. If you could get them to join in blanket sanctions, that would be one thing. But to do, <coughs> as some of those suggested, and say, cancel the grain, uh, the grain agreement, uh, you wouldn't hurt them. It didn't hurt them when it was, uh, when it was canceled uh, because of of uh, Afghanistan. It hasn't, didn't do anything for Afghanistan. And uh, it hurt a number of Americans. So 
all the things that we've done are those things that we believed uh, had a direct bearing on the crime that had been committed. The Didn't you in the fiber, excuse me, in the very fiber of your being hope that more substantive, stronger actions oh, couldn't have been taken? Of course. You, you, it was very frustrating to say, you know, why, why wasn't there something? But almost anything that you think of in that line would be hurting people who have no share of guilt in that tragedy. Now, just to hurt some other people, uh, to be striking back, would be somewhat the same guilt that the, uh, that the, the Soviets uh, mm -hmm. uh, have, have to bear. And so we've done what we could and we're going to continue. I said it would be a measured response we continue to think we're trying to worldwide get an agreement that they would have to join them with regard to tightening air safety requirements such as, so that such a thing can never happen again. Instead, they're standing up boasting that, well, if it happens again, we'll do it again. Um, this we're trying to do, the arms agreements, that we should have canceled the, the arms reduction talks. Why? The Soviet Union would not like nothing better than to be able to continue on their solo arms race and uh, their great supremacy in the world with regard to weaponry. It's only been world public opinion that has brought them into these negotiations. They don't dare sit on the sideline and to continue them. And I think with added leverage now because of this crime to, uh, is I think, of great benefit to us. Send their ambassador home, they'd send ours home. Is this a time in the world today to be without eyes and ears in Moscow? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. One last question, if I may. Uh, the legislation to uh, create a national holiday in memory of Martin Luther King. Yes. The White House has opposed it, now it's sending signals that it is for it. Why the change? No, we've. Uh, the only thing that could be construed as opposition was the same thing that many people felt, that couldn't this be a day such as picking a Sunday or something so that uh, you could recognize this day, the symbolism of it, and yet without the, the expense that it's going to be the, uh, of having an additional national holiday with all that that means. The, shutting down of everything, of government and everything else. Uh, this we express an opinion on that. But no, if the Congress passes that and sends it up here, I'll sign it. You were for it all along? What? Were you for it all along? I can recognize their desire. Uh, the, uh, our black community's desire for this symbol, this recognition of the gains that have been made and the progress that's been made not just by them, but by all of us. Mm -hmm. Because when we got rid of the bigotry and the discriminatory practices that were so prevalent in this land, we were all better off. It freed us to... But this is a like proposal to remember and remember. Just one question, we can admire the way. King. Yeah. Is he worthy? Is he a man you believe is worthy of such commemoration? I... I'm not going to make a judgment on that. I'm going to, I'm basing my judgment on what he means symbolically to a large percentage of our citizens who, because of him, finally changed this country in a way that it should have been changed a long time before that. Thank you, Mr. President. I really have to go with that.